So hello everyone and work up, welcome to the first colloquium of the year. And for those of you who are new, welcome to the Ostrom workshop. Um, one of the things that we have done just so everyone's on the same page is we have changed the way the colloquium works, which was strange to me because I realized normally by now I would have read Coastalie's paper and I would know exactly when I would have, yeah, okay, don't have a clue. So uh, what's going to happen is Coastalie is going to talk for 45-ish minutes. She has said she is happy to have interruptions along the way. Um, and and then we will have a long conversation uh, about what Coastalie presents. So I'm proud, though, today to represent uh, to uh, introduce you to Coastalie Simon. Um, I I'm actually having to read uh, all the various uh, accolades that she's received. Mm -hmm. Distinguished professor, Herman B. Wells Endowed Professor. She is at O'Neill. She is an Associate Vice Provost for Health Sciences. She's an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine, an editor of the journal Health e e uh, Economics, and quite honestly, over the years, has been just a dear and amazing friend and a researcher that I deeply respect for all that she does. Uh, so I'm very much looking forward to hearing uh, your presentation. And for those of you online, I will do my best to keep an eye on when questions pop up. Um, but no promises, it's always good fun. So, but I'll do my best to be patient. <laughs> we have a pretty full room. But with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Angie. And thank you, everybody, because I am so excited to be here in this kind of a setting, which I know is just the kind of atmosphere where new ideas and thoughts that I just wouldn't have and my colleagues wouldn't have come, come into you know, thinking about can, can arise. So really looking forward to also talking about how the themes in this work interact with, uh, intersect with things you're working on. And so I know I'm really looking forward to the discussion part of the So this is work that is joined with two collaborators. Sumeda Gupta is a faculty member in the economics department at IUI. You Indianapolis, and Dario Sacero, who is on the Zoom. I think Sumena might be also on the Zoom. I can see Dario right here. He's a PhD candidate in the O'Neill School, and this is paper about the important. I think the title is what it is, but I'll sort of talk about it as thinking about institutions. It's about the importance of schools as an institution. And thinking about how the how how life presents us with sometimes a way to get an answer to a question we think is really important to answer, but we can't come up with a randomized controlled trial or a survey that might give us the answer. And it really is that nature provides us with an experiment. And so it is using the experience of school closures during the COVID era, the way in which it happened allows us to mimic an experiment and then answer this all important question, which is how important is the school setting? How important are schools as an institution for the lives of, in this case, parents? You now there's also lots of research I'm gonna talk about, about of course, how important schools are as an institution in the lives of children. This is about this greater community. So I am going to hopefully press the right buttons. Could I? So some of this motivation is, it's, it's very clear to us, I think, why we think schools matter. It's a form of public spending that there is a long history behind motivated by the fact that it makes sense to have this kind of service, this kind of meeting the needs of society done through an institution like that. And there's lots of then policy, local policy, especially in how schools are functioning and in decisions that are being made. But there's always a question about funding. Right. So anytime people look towards, you know, what what do schools do in order to get funding, we can talk about how there are absolutely large societal improvements that come upon. We're going to talk about how for parents too, this is 
is a really valuable institution. Now, we're going to probably get a lot of discussion going about, well, how can you tell from some things that happened during the pandemic about the value of schools in more general? But so here, schools enhance lives of families. We know that schools present an opportunity for mobility in society because it is an equalizer in many ways. It is going to be provided in a way that is equalized, even though there's lots of questions about to what degree is the school system more of a local public good than a national public good because the financing of it comes from property value. So it is unequally distributed, right? So lots of questions about that. For parents, schools also provide a way in which their own lives can move forward, learning work, going to do things that aren't uh, um, educational supports, self-care, all of this too. There was a lot of disruption in everything that society provides as an institution in March, 2020. So education is not the only thing that was disrupted and showed us the value of institutions because we suddenly didn't have access to it. But We'll talk about how school disruptions happened in a way that also had a bit of a local element to it. So even though we're talking about disruptions that happened at the state level, policies changed and shutting down other things, they weren't always the same as the things that shut down the school. So we're going to isolate the things that really caused variation in why one school was shut down and another school was not to think about the parents who were affected. So. Um, we know that there are papers showing how disruption to schooling affects test scores of children. Some of us, including Dario and our colleagues, Seth Friedman and Kelly Marqua at the Federal Reserve Board of Chicago. We have um, uh, Cody Wing also there. They, we have, sorry, the slide, the, the yes. We've, we, we've written a paper that looked at children's outcomes. We looked at children's outcomes using healthcare claims data. We're able to show that school closures have an impact on children's is one of the first papers that showed this. And so our, now we're working, this next paper now is at parents' lives. So we, we know that there is there are gendered norms in family caregiving, and there's connections to labor market outcomes. So in all of this, we also know that the role that schools play is going to also be different depending on how much of resources those communi com different communities have outside of schools. And so it's not working. Oh, it's not working. Yeah, I will Thank you. Up. Sorry. So, so sorry. I'll just say next slide. Okay, that's fine. Sorry. So um, here's what we're going to do. Think about us getting information on children that are in schools and being able to also know who their parents are and the health of their parents. Specifically, think about all of the formal health care that their parents receive, and also having information to all of the grocery store and retail purchases of parents, being able to bring all this together, with the exact timing of when schools had what degree of closure, be able to look at schools that had more closures, schools that had fewer closures, parents of children in those two different types of settings and following them before and after the closures. Before the closures, we want to look at these two different types of ones who experienced school closures and ones who didn't and convince us ourselves that they look fairly similar in every other regard. And that it was somehow the decisions that were made by school boards that happened to go differently in one direction or another. And you might say, well, we'll control for things like region and many other things that you might say, oh, generally they tended to be making different decisions. And we'll say for communities that look alike as possible, we could imagine that there were maybe one pivotal 
vote on the school board that made the shutdown be longer or longer, right? So that we try to identify places that were really at the margin, look very similar otherwise, and then ask, what can we observe of the parents of the two types of schools? And so there's going to be a lot of data specific things. We're going to talk about how do we find out about school closures. We're looking at all schools in the US, looking at closures. We'll talk about how what does it mean to have a closure? How do we know what degree? How much reporting was there happening? So we're going to use another data source to identify school closures, which is cell phone pings. So we are going to compare information on schools that were interviewed where we did find out by their reports how much closure there was. But then we're going to try and um, use this other measure and we show validation of it, which is for all schools in the US using a database that tracks something like 20% of all cell phones in the US that look at degree of school closure by the degree to which the pings went down at the school. So that's what we're gonna be doing. We're gonna be looking at parental and present use. We're going to be looking at uh, difference by existing conditions, such as the characteristics of the community. And you're also going to then look at, we're gonna think of the concept of self-medication and think about formal and informal. And think about alcohol purchases. We've also got data on cigarette purchases we haven't yet um, processed, I think, but we And look at whether there are similar patterns, different patterns, are there patterns that differ by the type of community and where there's a response on one versus So what we find, here's, here's our results in a nutshell before one. We find that school closures are associated with to the extent we're going to view these as detrimental mental health effects, we're going to see increases in antidepressant prescriptions. We're going to be looking at individuals who do not have a history of past antidepressant prescriptions, but we can look at that in the data and say, we know there are people new yeah. antidepressant prescriptions. And we find that these are the, the effects are statistically detectable or only mothers, we do not find statistically detectable effects for fathers. And we find these effects are present mainly in very young children and older children. So kindergarten, elementary school and high school, I don't find it in the case of middle school. We then go on to look at alcohol sales and we find that alcohol sales also increase at the time of school closures. In our alcohol sales data, we cannot tell the, the gender of the purchaser because it's a household sort of, it's like the, all the scanners that are happening in grocery stores. I think some people here have worked with those data, the Nielsen data. And we'll talk about pros and cons of using another household panel information for alcohol, but the brutality. But, the magnitude of the effects in both cases are about a 2% effect for a school that is above the median closure. So think about two types of schools. One had below median school closures above, and one had above median school closures, as, as we saw it. The difference there is about a 2% higher of antidepressant, two percent higher alcohol consumption. So that's sort of the the, the results in a, a nutshell about the magnitudes and where it's affecting. Another thing, another question we are very interested in is how long these impacts last. It'd be that closures, even though they were only for a certain amount of time that there are continued increases in antidepressant use afterwards, and we don't see that. We see that it was sort of a short run effect. The increase happened, and then it goes back to pre-pandemic levels after school, uh, shortly after school openings happen. So that's the other, you don't see slightly. Like, so yep, uh, one before. So if we think of what I'm going to talk about the 
amount of school closures and mobility. There's been lots written about how mobility changed during the pandemic. We remember New York Times articles that talked in early, um, probably from you know, March third week onwards, were showing up, showing us pictures saying, "Here's how quickly everything shut down." We knew there were policies that were saying stay at home, but we wouldn't know the degree to which life ground to a halt because so many of the data systems we have report things with a long lag. Think about all the surveys we love to use, American Community Survey, current populations, or all these surveys take about two years to come out because you gotta go conduct the survey, you gotta do lots of pre-processing, it just will take a long amount of time, right? So this time period, of the sh shutdown time period, the COVID era also made us aware of a lot of data sources. So thinking about this as the commons ecosphere of where data gets produced, there are many commercial sources of data that collect things that would be a substitute in some way for what the surveys are collecting, but we really didn't know a lot about them because they were not available for research. They were being used for marketing and other commercial purposes. During the pandemic, many of these companies said, we can be data for good providers. And they said, we're going to help the public health cause by offering our data for free. So we took advantage of some of these data for good programs and got to know these mobility data sets. So the things that were being reported in the New York Times were data from cell phone pings show the degree to which there was a reduction in activity, because it turns out every time I am saying okay to something that's tracking me because I want to be able to say when I'm arriving for my groceries or whatever, it's also packaging this information and selling it to marketing companies. But then it's all um, because these companies follow laws about identity, there's nothing that is associating my name with it. But I do know what area my cell phone is during the night hours, during the work hours. And so it is data that we have to be very careful of thinking, how much do we want to be using it for things? It was extremely important during the public health emergencies to have this source of data for public health agencies. Right? We, we um, did some webinars that included public health officials from many counties that were talking about how they were trying to use this data to monitor what's happening in their own counties so was extremely important. But, um, so we used, we got a, a data use agreement, the university signed with these companies under this data for good program right then that allowed us to do COVID related research with these data. So we were able to understand where each school was and the number of cell phone pings that were happening at those schools over a long period of time. And so we could say, this is sort of your trend or your baseline. And then let's see what percent of a change happened on March. Well, all the days throughout till and would know that some places started to come back faster rate reopened in the fall of 2020. And some places continued to close through even the January the next year. So we, we are able to get variation off of this measure. So next slide, please. Then I'm gonna show you what it looks like over a certain period of time. I know it's too small over here to look at, but I'll just kind of describe what it is that we're telling. This is just on average across the nation. So I haven't yet started to use the variation that's occurring. And what this is, is that I'm gonna show different cohorts of people by different years. So these are just, down here are just months and the different lines are different years. So think about it as, I'm gonna focus on the blue, or the triangles to show what 2020 was like. And the red dots are the, what's it like in other years before that? That is, we know that schools shut down during the summer. So June, July, August, there's even in the red dots, there is a closure that happens. Mm -hmm. But during the 2020 period, from March, the sudden decline, and then a little bit 
tiny bit of an increase. And then there was an after the reopening in the fall, we didn't go back as we usually did, about half a third. And then it stayed continually low until it really didn't start to get back to pre-pandemic until the, the next year. All right, so that's the um, picture of what we see nationally. And we're gonna be exploiting this kind of difference. We're going to be looking at what is typically a story in your school district in the previous years compared to the March 2020 time period and throughout. So it's compared to how parents use of antidepressants were in the same area in prior years. So I, I mentioned that we, we really needed to check whether these cell phone ping based measures of school closures mimic what is known from the few schools that actually did keep uh, and were reporting good validated data. So there's a, a survey, uh, I forget the title of it right now. I was part of some of the there were these efforts we took part in with the CDC to actually inter to to try and figure out school by school before before we knew of these um, cell phone measures for the schools. We had a cross university consortium. I think some of the PhD students might have still remember these. We were trying to survey, call go on their websites, figure out anything we could and fill out these surveys and then the CDC would collect them. And it just turned out to be so difficult. So we do have some measures like these that are the in-person schooling um, measures, but the they correlate extremely well with our cell phone based measures. And so now the papers on school closures all sort of really shifted to using these cell phone based measures. Next slide, please. So we're gonna think about how for parents, there is um, you know, lots of reasons why in an unexpected situation of school closures, we're going to have a lot of stress introduced. And it's gonna be very different from, for example, what happens during a summer, because that's a lot more of a control, like planned, right? So we can't really point to the summer and say, that's a way we could tell the value of schools. Look at how parents' lives are during the summer versus the rest of the school year. Lots that would be confounding. And so this kind of a sudden availability is where we, uh, of schools is where we would be. And we think mechanisms through which these effects might be happening include financial insecurity from having to stay home suddenly to all kinds of social isolation. So talking about the generalizability of these results, when we've uh, presented this work, often people have talked to us about whether we should expect that any research that was done during the COVID era, there's lots of papers that have used the way that policy or responses deferred across areas to look at causal questions about what do we know about the value of this institution? Isn't all of that research specific to a time of a pandemic? So what to think about it is, yes, it, it was during a time when <laughs> other things were not available in society, but we think about if there is going to be any future event, that suddenly st shuts down schools, it's probably not gonna occur in isolation. It's probably gonna be because other areas were also affected, uh, like society is affected. So availability of childcare elsewhere might be affected too. For example, if it turns out that it is an, some sort of a power grid failure that is going to cause schools to shut down, it's probably the case that everything else also. So learning from times of emergency situations does mean we're talking about emergency situations, but that's probably a setting in which we would be really thinking. Next book, please. Um, the next book. All right, so now I'll talk about the health data we combine these cell phone data with. So there is there are um, many collections of healthcare data that people for research to know about how 
what's something happening in society mm -hmm. affecting people's health. Sometimes it is looking at actual mortality records, but short of mortality records, we have to go to health care. There is sometimes health data that is collected while in a doctor's office. So electronic health records might have blood test results or other things, but we kind of have to go off of existing institutions to be able to get this data. So health insurance, paying for health care, existing institution that yields data on people's health care. And so sometimes I'll use the word health, but really think about it as we can only view it because of people's access to health care. The only health outcome we can really observe irrespective of whether somebody goes to receive health care is mortality. And that's just such an extreme. Clarifying question, the, the school mobility data using the, the, the cell phone uh, measurements is capturing both Student cell phones and parents. Good question. Good question. So think of it as um, we what we want is just a measure of activity of whether the school is closed or not, 50% closed or not. For elementary schools, these are teachers and parents dropping off and bus drivers and so on. For high schools, it's definitely so it's yes, it's a mix of where it's coming from, but it's just general activity. <laughs> um so there is a um private insured, commercial insured databases. And then there's also Medicaid and Medicare, government collected data. So we use a private commercial insurance database. It has something like 50 million people in it over the time period we're looking at. Um, so we have to keep that in mind, thinking about we, this being a commercially insured population. We had access to data that comes through the Medicaid program, for example, we'd be able to get a different set of or, or other types. But on that, this is extremely rich data. It is also very high quality data because it goes through a lot of verifications. Getting a healthcare bill paid means that it sort of cleans the data along the way. And so what we get is very clean data because somebody, you know, everything that was an anomaly got questioned and here we have the correct ND, the, the coding of it is there. So we can identify all the healthcare events and we can identify what are prescription claims for antidepressants by using the 11 digit code of the prescription, the NDC. Uh, alcohol sales data come from Nielsen, which has something like, is it something like 50% of all grocery and retail in the US? That's right. Something like that. So that too, high quality in that it is scanning at the UPC level and identifies categories like alcohol. So this, uh, there are drawbacks to it. We, when we look at the healthcare claim, claims data, we know the enrollees five of residents. And so we can pretty closely map it to their school district. We bring in a shape file that tells us the, we've done this a bunch of different ways, but anyway, we're, we're looking at sometimes the catchment areas of the schools or the school address and can link this to say, all right, you, this family that we see in the healthcare claims, you have this as your address, you have uh, a child in this, th this age range, that's probably this elementary school, middle school and high school. And so everything gets merged together to create a data set that will have over time and at the granular space information about what's happening to the health care outcomes and what's happening to exposure to school closures. So clarifying question, does this, uh, it doesn't sound like it, but are you able to differentiate between private and public? Um, Yes, I believe so, but I think do we remove Dario with Sumeda? <laughs> private schools? Not to call. No. So we have public schools. I just, okay, we'll come back to it during discussion. Something. Neil said something. Yeah. 
Oh, it's not hearing. I think we're not. Yeah, so we have public schools. He's talking about. Oh. We don't have any private schools. Sorry, we'll try and turn the audio on, and if not, we'll come back during discussion. Yeah, we can. Just... Yeah, he's muted. Okay, we'll, we'll come back to this. So think of this really large database now that allows us to look at some impacts. I'm going to go on to the next. Can I just ask for thing? So how do you identify parents again? And then what is going to be the unit of analysis? Is it a parent? It's a parent, yes. Okay, so good question. This is, we have in our data, we can go into all the details of how we, so in the claims data, there will be a house that there will be an enrollment ID. So think about when we sign up for health insurance, any dependents will be grouped together and have a same, like our insurance card will have a group ID that's the same. Based on that, we then see what does, what does the composition look like of the set of people who are on this? And we say, you are the likely parent of this child based on age differences, because they never actually record you know, in the in data. And so once we've done that, we then say, well, this is a made up family within using certain algorithms with this data. How much does our distribution match what we can get from the American Community Survey? And so we say, like, what, what does the families we put together look like compared to the ACS? And we match pretty clearly, uh, pretty closely, the distribution of children, whether it's assignment to mothers or fathers. What is your other question? So the unit of analysis is going to be a parent. So yeah. not a, or a father. Yeah, we're looking at parents, mm -hmm. antidepressant. Next slide, please. Okay. So I'm now going to bring back the slide that I earlier showed because it's gonna help in explaining this way in which we're going to account for the fact that even if I am a community whose school stayed closed longer, there may be lots of other things different about my community that might affect whether I respond differently to the pandemic. So we're going to be able to compare how the community was impacted during COVID era by the degree of school closures relative to what the typical pattern of antidepressant use would have been for a similar cohort of parents, not me, but the parents of kids who came before my kids in other years, many other years, because we think that sets a baseline. So that's what this red line is. It is by taking, I'll describe how we do this, by taking the, and this is a the common method that was used for a lot of pandemic research, remember we heard terms like excess deaths. Instead of COVID deaths, let's look at excess deaths. Basically what the CDC said was, what would March 2020 deaths have looked like in previous years? What were March deaths like? And they said, oh, compared to every other year's March deaths, friends, here's what March 2020 was. So we'll call these excess deaths that wouldn't have occurred Think about this as excess prescription medications relative to a time pattern that we can use many people who were in our data earlier. They, if we follow a cohort, so we're going to talk about a cohort that we can follow for essentially like three years, let's say, about nine months, I think. We, we want to be able to first look at their year in retrospect and say, now we've identified a set of people who have not had antidepressants in the last month. So we'll call them antidepressant naive. And then now we can follow them for two years. Follow them for two years in time periods that end entirely before COVID starts. So let's say 2017 to 2019 or 2016 to 2019. We've been able to follow them for a year to confirm that they're you, uh, that they're antidepressant naive, and then two years of what it looks like afterwards. Uh, what is their hazard rate of getting on to new antidepressants? And then we'll compare them to people who started their three-year period such that they are experiencing the pandemic, and we can look at those people in the same month. When we compare those two and look at the change, and we say, yep, that is what we expected, the school mobility of the period of the people who are experiencing the pandemic really 
It's not so much that summer was different. It's that April, March, April, May was different. <laughs> and it is also that uh, going back to school, August was different, but not as much as March was different. Next slide, please. So we have a difference in difference setup. We have a cohort that is our control cohort. They lived through similar seasonal months. And then we have the exposed cohort. We look at an indicator for are you in the exposed cohort or the unexposed cohort, the control or the treatment, interacted with and how much did your schools change in your area versus somebody else's? So that's the two layers of differences we've got. Time period and exposure to the mobility change. And then we put in a whole bunch of, okay, we'll take into account that your zip code is different in all time periods than other zip codes. Take into account that this week is different than all other weeks nationally. So after taking the out, we can look at the coefficients that are going, you know, the, the, the signal of to what extent was being in the exposed cohort in a school district that closed a lot compared to being in the exposed cohort in a control, in a community that didn't close a lot and so on. Lots of these differences we can look at. And then we look at, there are some assumptions where we can ask ourselves if in prior periods than the pandemic, did you, these two cohorts, kind of tend to trend together in the rate at which you were getting new antidepressants, we can kind of think like we've got a good experiment. They look like they follow each other. And it is only when we turn on the switch of differential exposure to school closures that we get the results that we get. So next slide, please. We also look at it separately by type of school because we think that there may be different stress, stressors that account that come from having a middle school close versus an elementary school close and so on. And then we also do things by uh, grouping the months together by like seasons. So we've got different specifications. Next slide, please. So I'm going to show the, the results by only just plotting those coefficients. So we're just gonna tell a story of where are we seeing an impact? So first, talk about the results from others. What we have on the y-axis is the amount by which prescriptions, new prescriptions for antidepressants went up or down. So all the positive numbers say that during the month, of, of between March and May 2020, relative to other years, so relative to earlier cohorts, there was about a two to three percent increase in the use of antidepressants. And it then kind of goes down in the summer. And then in the period of the fall openings, which is when there was again, a, oh, school's summer is over and we're not going back, surprise, there is a fail, right? And then it just peters out and goes right to zero. In the case of fathers, we see some noisy estimates, but there's nothing statistically detectable there. Next slide, please. And so I'm going to just skip the, these basically just because they're just a bunch of numbers that summarizes that story. But we are able to show you know, that it is happening at the time period we expect it to be happening and that it is happening elementary and high rather than middle school papers. Um, next slide, please. We are able to look at different zip codes by whether they are above median in composition racially of like black, white, Hispanic, and Asian. And we find the effects are concentrated in communities that are higher than median um, black and Asian, and we find statistically not as precise and smaller estimates for white and Hispanic communities. We find, um, uh, next slide please, is gonna show by um, what kind of magnitudes we're thinking. So we think about school closures as there are some schools that were, you know, like 
Florida schools were in the first quartile, they really didn't shut down that much. And maybe uh, no, upstate New York or California schools were more in the fourth quartile. Change in prescriptions are, it's not a linear relationship. We really find that they're concentrated in the, in the top three, two quartiles that were closed rather than the highest closure. Okay. Next slide, please. Um, I'm now going to describe how the alcohol results end up being fairly similar in magnitude, except that we don't have the ability there to separate out by gender. But we are looking. Or I was laughing. Or I was laughing that you can't. That we can. <laughs> I know we were thinking <laughs> this. So one is that you know even if the household purchasing happens by one parent, it's consumption of the whole. Family and so even if we had gender, we wouldn't yeah. use it. The other is that there is a household self-reported panel. That lots of people are showing that reports of alcohol consumption are not to be you know used a lot in research. So, oh yeah, here it is. Greater than fifty percent of um, the total sales volume, and we're using a very similar model here. And we're gonna see effects on the next slide. Basically, are showing again an increase. They happen. Interestingly, more so from the not opening in the fall surprise rather than the, <laughs> what, it is, what it is. Next slide, the magnitudes are very similar, about 2% or so. Next slide, please. So I know I'm, I'm getting close to 20, um, 45 minutes in, but I want to describe that, that there are a whole bunch of things you might say, well, what about? So here are some of the what abouts that we have done. Uh, I'll sort of, um, well, you know, how much is it our controls are driving things? What if we did the most raw form of a regression, which did not, you know, put in a whole lot of controls, we actually find very, very similar results. Um, another, actually, let me see. Um, I'll describe one that's not on here yet as a, a, a bullet point, but the thing that you might be worried about, weren't there a whole lot of other policies going on than school closures? How do we know it's capturing school closures? So one is that the level at which the other policies were changing really was at a greater level. It was either the county or much more often the state or national. So the variation in schools, actually, there's a lot going on. Even in the same counties, there are, there's a lot that is changing. It's a lot that's changing by whether it's middle school or high school, because all the schools are having different policies of the younger kids come back and the older kids wouldn't or vice versa. So even after we control for a set of other policies on closures, the results will um, we'll show, I think, in the next slide, a couple of other models. Mm -hmm. So one right before that. Okay. So we looked at what about parents who already had an antidepressant prescription? Because we thought maybe it might be that things got really worse for a population that already was on antidepressants. But it actually turns out that we see no statistically different effects for these parents. So somehow it what it means is that we don't look at whether you have any antidepressant prescription they already had. We looked at whether it increased in, in dosage or whether there was co-prescribing of benzodiazepine, other things going on, anti-anxiety anti medications with antidepressants, and, and that does not, it has an impact. So it seems somehow perhaps parents who are already connected to healthcare and receiving mental health care, partly because there was telehealth, maybe that was a form of healthcare that helped in being resilient. Next slide, please. Um, we wondered, is it that the use of every product went up? We do know that there was a lot of income coming in from the pandemic checks, and so could there be something, but whatever is happening is not correlated with school closures. We do not see anything in a few other products. Um, next slide. Yeah. So I'm uh, at 12.45. <laughs> I wanted to get to the conclusions. I'd say that. So what do we do? We look at time periods when schools closed unexpectedly, and we ask whether 
compared to similar parents in other time periods in the same area, compared to everybody nationally whose schools were not closing as much, do we see anything systematic in the use of new antidepressant prescriptions and in alcohol sales? And we're trying to do this off of not self-reported data, but administratively collected data. We know there are trade-offs. We can't get as much into the demographics of who it is, and especially like the alcohol data. But um, we do find that there are these systematic increases in antidepressant use in use of alcohol. Magnitudes are about the same of a 2% increase. We have to think about, do we think that's large or what? And that um, it is concentrated in communities that you might think have more reliance on, on schooling. Um, and um, but but it's not like a consistent story necessarily, and we think that there may be time periods of if if it was time periods where healthcare was as available as normal times, maybe we'd have seen even a larger increase. On the other hand, it could be a sign that telehealth was working well that we did see an increase in health use. So this is where we are. The last slide. Um, I'm very interested to hear comments and thoughts about what we learned from this. Thank you very much. <laughs> Do I moderate or? Oh. Oh. Rats, you can moderate. Yeah, students first. Oh, so <laughs> Go ahead, after you. Yeah, I'll wait for you. Yeah. Oh. Um, so the generated data was to primarily determine the treatment status, whether the school was closed or not. Um, and it's degree of school closing. So think about it as what is the scent by which your activity is lower mm -hmm. than baseline? Is it a hundred percent closing like in March or is it 50%? So, you had known the school schedule or school policy like directly shows like a deterministic way for school closures. Um, had, had you known that um, that'd be like a better treatment assignment? Yeah, good question. So when we, um, uh, there's several papers on, school closures and other outcomes. We looked at one paper that was on how school closures affected the rate of COVID infections in a community, for example. For those things, we were really trying to go to the schools or trying to find out from the schools. But it turned out that it wasn't very reliable data for all schools. And the way that school closures, closures happened, it was kind of apples to oranges. So some schools would say, we had second and third grade Come on, Tuesdays and Thursdays, and then we had this, and then we had, you know, oh, oh, that policy you read on our website, oh, that changed. So that's why we went to this after validating across the schools that did have some data on openings. Yeah. Oh, again, <laughs> oh, okay. thank you for, for stimulating research. Um, it's cool to see put all the pieces together too. Um, so you mentioned you mentioned one tiny little blip about um how you were evaluating uh, studies of, of people who had commercial, commercially, uh, commercial health insurance as opposed to people who weren't on Medicaid and weren't on Medicare. So I looked up those statistics and I was like, that your study is probably like maybe less than 50% of the population. Does that seem like about the right number? Because I looked up Medicare statistics, it says about 25.4% of, of adults are enrolled in Medicare. So that's not part of your study. And then, and that was like about 65.5 million people. And then in like December, 2021, 86.3 million people, a greater number were enrolled in Medicaid and SHIP. So does it mean those- I'd love to, yeah, talk about those numbers. So, so um, yes, so let's think of, so definitely we think that if we could have a database that is all payer or all use regardless of payment, it would be good. Yes. And it is hard to come by such a thing. But um, Medicare, so Medicare is predominantly over 65 age. And so um, while there are uh, probably a substantial number who have 
children in, in, in K through 12, it's pre predominantly not the population to be looking for parents with, um, on the other hand, Medicaid, very relevant. So with Medicaid, the problem although is that even though there was this large increase in enrollment numbers that occurred, uh, some of it is because enrollment, there was a, there was a rule that said that no Medicaid uh, disenrollment would happen from the during the public health emergency. And so even individuals who might have not known they were on Medicaid, you know, sort of continued. So, so the number, that number is somewhat elevated in terms of how representative it is of people who actually would have been on Medicaid. But regardless, it is an extremely big data hole that we do not have information on. It is possible with a very long lag to get the data on Medicaid, um, but it also would be a while. Very, very difficult to get <laughs> missions. It takes a, and, and a lot of money to get the access, although it is definitely an area we want to try and go into next with a grant proposal. <laughs> Thank you. Stupid. Any other students before we move on? Mm -hmm. I'll start from the back. I'm just going to go around. I see the hands. Um, so I was wondering for the, sorry, for the alcohol uh, sales data, is that, is that just retail um, and not like say, the restaurants? Not bars, not yeah. restaurants, yes. Uh, so I was wondering about like substitute. Very good question, yes. So... Um, the substitution question would be if, if we thought that it was due to bar closure. So I think what we have done, and please co-authors who are there uh, on Zoom, is that what, even when we control for restaurant and bar closures, we see the same result. Is that right, Correct. Dario, you want to come in? Correct. So that's it. Horrible. Can you hear me? Maybe not. So I believe that is a yeah. see in the chat. Maybe he's ah, right. we, we, thank you, Dario. And and if you're able to put in the chat, was it that we controlled for bar and restaurant closure policies and didn't see results that we heard? You're unable to hear, but I think we, uh, it's a very good question and one that we, where our results show us. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. Next was next. Um, so first of all, I cannot believe it, the uh, aggregation project that this was. <laughs> like, it's uh, just been very um, awesome and impressive. I have kind of two types of questions. One is about sort of um, uh, antidepressants as a measure for stress. Um, so first of all, what is antidepressants treating exactly and how are we thinking about the mechanism? Is it that people that are already, as you sort of pointed out, stressed, now increasing their prescriptions? And that may lead me to the more potentially relevant question of, um, we know that there were a lot of stresses on the healthcare system at this time. Right. And so my question is, is, isn't there a cap in the capacity of the healthcare system to issue prescriptions for healthcare for antidepressants? And it's so, you know, uh, that would necessarily, I don't know if that necessarily, in other words, you could be biasing downward, right? The potential yes. effect. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious if you ran into that um, challenge. And then what do you think is going on in middle school? Is it that the parents are already so stressed by having children in middle school? <laughs> they are already uh, taking advantage of the healthcare system in the way that you suggested. That would mean that there wasn't you know, changes um, there and whether the gender of the child. Uh, mm -hmm. Related yes. to middle school to question, right? But also, also uh, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Definitely really interesting. So I completely agree with you. Like we what we should be viewing ourselves as seeing is that there is this conceptual mapping of what do we really care about? We care about rest levels, we care about what's happening to the you know, the really, really like health in the truest comprehensive way of thinking about well-being. 
but we can't get at that. We only have this measure of antidepressant use. And so what connects the two is, oh, well, it's not a one for one, it's among individuals experiencing this sort of depression. You have to get connected to care. You have to under, you have to act on, you have to have the time to go. You have to find a way to get into an appointment at a time when every place is saying, oh, we are triaging and only will take COVID patients or emergencies. Is it that people are being told, well, even if there's a place that will accept me, I really don't want to go and risk infecting my family. Right? So I might not go. How well did telehealth present itself to new users. So we knew that there was a good amount of shifting of existing people who are used in behavioral health were shifted to telehealth well. But if I am simply experiencing new symptoms onset, I wouldn't be going to my family practitioner perhaps, or I don't know how that would be. So that's a sense in which maybe this is an underestimate of what we are capturing. Yes. It's also the what kind of, I mean, this is where the, it's too bad we're missing all the Medicaid families, for example, to know is it that if we could really identify socioeconomic status, would we see this differentiation of with our families that are able to so no. Yeah, I'm trying to, this is this is really impressive work, as she was starting to say, uh, in putting the data. Uh, I'm trying to look at it from an institutional perspective. And you put the, put the workshop hat on here a little bit. And one of the things from institutional analysis is, is generally is that it's really tough to isolate the effect of any one institution on any one sort of process. And so you're trying to pick out the effect of the school closures on these various sort of measures. And, and, and you've done a great job of it. But there's one, one other set of institutions that I think is so intrinsically, in, intrinsically connected to um, uh, the, the, the adults in this in, in the household is employment status. Employment, yeah. 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 And now I don't know if the employment data you could get at would be at the same scale or whether it would be at the place of employment or the house of employment, but you might be able to get some zip code sort of Yes, yes, by yes, that, right, right. but, but yeah. it, you know, because it, and, it, and it's going to have an interactive effect because uh, some of the loss of jobs is going to come from the school closure, uh, you know, uh, especially for the working mothers. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, so it's sort of like, it, it would like, it's hard for you to tell whether everything you're seeing here is just from the school closing or the effect of that has on climate and the fact that it has on income i have a little concern with the alcohol consumption thing what's the family budget you know you, you pick two other things that they're gonna they're gonna spend money on which is fine but you don't have the total budget that a family has to spend on groceries i mean if you could get data on the total grocery expenditures but but then again you have the spillover effects of you know, restaurants or use in that sort of thing. I mean, it, it, it's sort of another set of complications, but just that there's there's this tight connection between employment and, and the school closures that um, uh, may take another project for you to, to tease it out. Yes, no, this is, we've thought a lot about these mechanisms of income versus labor market. And that also gets at gender. Like there's so much heterogeneity here in what could be happening that we don't have enough data to tease out, but we are just capturing right. this average effect. It would be interesting, very important to, to look at under what circumstances did the negative repercussions happen? Was it for cases where parents could work from home or was it cases where parents yeah. were not and right. therefore they were present at home with children were mentally present, were not trying to try to work at the same time. On the other hand, that meant they had lower incomes. Right. To what extent did the pandemic checks count for income so that it was right. really the families that weren't trying to do work at the same time and these income subsidies really helped in being present for children? We can't really get it, although I think trying to, trying to capture zip code level averages is something we've discussed, whether we can't really with the American Community Survey 
for the pandemic period because we need a five-year data set from ACS to get the zip code level averages. But at least unemployment rates, we've got plenty. Um, we've got a response from one of your colleagues. Gustavo, you're next. Yes, we include county level unemployment rates as okay. our so you have that in there. levels. But um, you're suggesting interact with. Well, and the complications you just raised about different types of employment are going to have different interactions with the school closing. Uh, and so you kind of have to trace all that out. And uh, maybe your next project. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, so. But, uh, so awesome paper. I have, I think, uh, three comments. I think the first one you can do it with the data that you have. It's, I would be particularly, so the key idea here is that alcohol and antidepressants work as substitutes. I would be particularly worried for people that are using as complements. So what, <laughs> what, what, what is, is maybe you want to interact and see yeah. the effects is, is even worse in those cases. The second one, if Maybe I got it wrong, but uh, it seems that for at least for some specifications, we are getting lower on le on null results for for the Hispanic community. Yes. So, yeah. Yeah. what about checking if grandma is at home? Hmm. That would be really awesome to reinforce your mechanisms. It's like if grandma is at home and you have uh, you know young kids. That's a different thing, and that may be the case of many Latin families. And I don't know if you can do that with the data because you need. A she's in the household at least. And usually no, grandma no. would not be part of the okay. insurance. Okay. Yeah. So okay, so uh, sorry about that. So yeah, but we could try again if we could do something with zip code. I don't know. No. Okay. And then my third comment is more about interpretation. It's uh when you are presenting and I was reading the paper, I was uh, in many occasions thinking about what is the worst possible scenario when you're thinking about exposure to a negative shock? And is that this temporary exposure give you very long-term or permanent effects. You are like early exposure to violence and then horrible things that happen, okay? Early exposure to malnutrition and then blah. But here you are finding that the effects wash away after a couple of years. So it kind of, uh, clash, for example, with literature on addiction. I would say you are exposed, you start with antidepressants and then you get addicted and you cannot you can come go. back. Uh, so, so essentially, or, or maybe with alcohol, the same thing. So the whole point on, on drugs is that you have this addictive behavior and we are not finding that here. So what is going on? How do we read these results? And how do we connect those results with what people are finding in the literature on addictions? Or I would say even broader on long-term effects or of temporary mm -hmm. shocks. Uh, and I don't have an answer. I think it's, it would be super interesting to, you know, problematize that that issue. No. Oh, this is such a, yeah, such a such a good point. We had not thought, actually. I don't think this has come up before, but it's so important to contract like to be able to pull in that literature. Say, what might be the differences? Well, even identify coming back to I think to you. Point before is like trying to identify for which type of households you are observing some kind of a more long term effect, even if it's of the same side, but that doesn't wash away, you know, over yeah. time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, uh, yes, we'll keep trying. This is okay. My question I'm so eager to hear you say a little more about school closures themselves after the amount yes. of thought you've put in. Yeah. <laughs> so, our school districts around the country had never faced anything like this before. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So, next time, how would you like to see our school districts? <laughs> oh, oh, this is a oh, <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's it. The, looking back at school closures, there's so much people have to say about what are the things we learned in retrospect. And so many places where we are continue, so we're now talking about the impacts of children, I mean, we're going to be studying the impacts on the children's lives for a long time. And they are getting back to your point, Gustav. 
there's a lot to think there is permanent scarring, right? A lot of the research is showing kids who, you know, I had I had six kids in through 12 at the time of the pandemic. Wow. I was watching the impacts on, I had two who were going from daycare to kindergarten. And their way of learning how to read, like was very different of how they experienced, right? So they, I'm imagining that cohort is going to have permanent impacts. So we look back and we say, we thought at the time that everybody was equally likely to be susceptible to COVID. Like we had to protect everyone equally. Right. And we didn't understand the age gradient at the time. So the question is not just how would we do things differently, but what information would we have at the time we're making decisions? That's number one. And the number number two is the salience of the things we can't pay immediate attention to. So at the time when all these discussions, like daycare closures, you know, everything happening. Nobody was really weighing the, oh, we, we know from previous research that uh, if you don't learn to read by a certain age, this could have permanent impacts. We're like, there is an emergency. Respiratory, you know, respirate, uh, whatever. All this equipment is needed. This hospital is running short on bed. So salient was what do we do right now? Not thinking about the what might be the long-term consequences. So I don't know that we'd act any differently, except to say how we change that. <laughs> Here. Yeah, Very briefly, and thank you. I want to follow up a bit on the thematic direction where you took us on the so what, the learning from the research. But first, thank you very much. Not only is I read, had a chance to read some of it, like that, it's clear, it's well written, you know, that counts. But congratulations on the research questions themselves. You've got to start with something, and you, you began in a really good place, I think, an important place. My question outside, one random question. I'm curious because of past interest in ethnic media. And I'm curious, I haven't seen research. I used to be more familiar with ethnic media's impact in health arenas and communities. And I haven't seen anything for some years. I haven't looked, I haven't needed to. But I'm curious if you've seen anything, and I don't need a response now and take time, but I'm curious about the applications. There is research about the application of ethnic media in identifying in community health needs, health resources related. I haven't seen much information about that. So if there is anything about that, I'd love to know about it sometime. But my other question, and I'm sitting by a fan which makes noise, so I couldn't hear all your answer to the question. But I'm thinking about some of, well, the question you're asking, the research project you had was somewhat unique and singular because it hadn't exactly been done before. But some of the findings are not singular or, or outliers themselves in terms of relative impacts on certain communities. So I'm curious about what can municipalities, governments, health agencies learn in a way of an almost equity lens, if you will, strategy tools and such mm -hmm. can be applied at the next pandemic or pandemic light or call it climate change, call it whatever you want. And, uh, and uh, what's going to, how can these impacts, relatively different impacts on different communities, be thought of as part of their planning, policy making, and implementation of responses to problems? So, your imaginationing, if you will, <laughs> about the application of this research to such things would be very helpful. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, I think when we think about these long run impacts, they are particularly concern should be about okay, there's going to be some communities some families that are going to be so well resourced that they can make up for what the institutions are not able to provide and that there will be investments along different points of the life course where we don't have to be as worried compared to communities where that's not going to be the case it's not going to be that there's going to be extra tutors brought in or ways that so, so thinking of what, what protecting communities really means is thinking about all the trade-offs involved rather than let's just really close these schools because that's the best thing that can be done. Let's, let's think about what are ways to keep schools open in a safe way, especially in communities where you're thinking this long run impact might be larger. Is that, that a way to you think of? But you're right, I, it'll be something to think about as the all the way around. Hold on. <laughs> okay. 
Um, great paper. I really liked the the whole concept. Um, but maybe another question that's just along the lines of you probably can't get the data there, but I thought would be interesting is, is there a way to tell whether prescription has been written from telemedicine versus in person? Because I, when you said telemedicine, I actually hadn't thought about it to that moment. It's like, wow, that could have been a big thing. And you made a comment that, you know, people aren't going to start using telemedicine to ask for that. But if you already have a primary care provider, oh, yeah, maybe they and you're talking about the kid's cold or whatever, you're going to mention because you're on the phone. And I, it just seems to me like that would be, oh, here, have an anxiety med. I'm sure you're going through a lot. So I yes, wonder if there yes. is some indication of the difference between I, yes. So we have used other other PhD students at IU have been doing their dissertation using these data to look at telehealth. So I'm aware that the issue there's not there wasn't consistent use of telehealth codes, but there is a measure of telehealth we can look at. Sometimes it was that a telehealth visit was being billed as using the code of in in person because they equated the, the rates. But I think that is something, Ariel, we could try, right? We could look at whether there was, we might not be statistically powered enough to tell the difference between the two, but we could look at, that's a good point I will try in there. And, and the other thing is this point about like, creating the list of what will we do differently in the next? Uh, which I think is just an amazing question, but like then if you even had a, a, a list that was just a few items that everybody should know about, you know, how would you then go about making it available for use? And like, who would go look at that list in that moment? Would they just go back into Panic City or whatever? I mean, just like, it would be an interesting thought experiment to figure out how do you make everybody know? There's this list of things we have to think about. Let's hold, you know. I have a clarifying question and a comment. The clarifying question, you said you created um, an antidepressant naive cohort. Mm -hmm. Did you do that for the alcohol as well? For alcohol, because it's not at the household level, it's just at the community level. We cannot tell. So you're just like, the effect above like whatever it's two three percent or something like that right yeah yeah above baseline yeah. Yeah. and so my comment is we know that domestic violence was very high during the pandemic and that there's a high correlation with alcohol, with alcohol. Substance yep. use and domestic violence as well and i'm wondering if sort of along the lines of like is it school closure or is it unemployment is it school closure or is it the family relationship that maybe had mm -hmm. some extra stressors and maybe you know like alcohol yeah. coming yeah. into play as well so i know there are um health surveys on state level that you can maybe use to control for domestic violence during pandemic i don't know if there are count level activities, mm -hmm. but i think it could be interesting to add it as a control as well especially because we're seeing the antidepressant use in mothers specifically um that could be potentially something yeah very, oh yeah um, very interesting so i think that even though we control for the county unemployment rate, this might be a case of interacting. So is it that if, but you don't know which way the causality runs, like school closures and unemployment rates, you know, is, is one. But if we were to ask, did alcohol use increase in places that schools closed that had a high unemployment rate? Yeah, that would be the kind of to look at. And domestic violence, I think it is that absolutely, like we really, there are reasons, data is the only reason that we couldn't do anything because I think that, as you know from your, it's it's going to be so hard to find large scale data on domestic violence that has the, that even when you can get the data, the geographic identifiers are hidden. Maybe state, but county, I don't think. Yeah. Once you get to the state level, losing the, yeah, the right. small grain by uh, Thank you. It's just a, question about uh, how to think on the effect size that is uh, on the estimates. 
And uh, I wonder if with the data you have, you can do this or even maybe looking at different papers on the extent to which of the nature of the school closure is the one inducing the, the effect. And I'm thinking of like recent sad news, like for example, uh, during an event of a school shooting, there is also a school closure yeah. that could be driving also, you know, some yeah. extent or like some effect on um, parents' mental health. And uh, I wonder if that could be a way in which you can say, or like, is this a large effect? Or maybe going to Gustavo's uh, point, like, uh, is this a way to the disentangle? Uh, why are we uh, observing uh, the effects to diminish uh, over time? And uh, I mean, again, again, maybe there could be some data you can use for the, to do like some sort of placebo. Well, it's not a placebo test, but it's like a comparison uh -huh. of. All right, so there is. There's work, you know, Molly Schnell and Janet Curry have a paper on school shootings and children's mental health. I don't know if they have also looked at parents' mental health, but it could be a way to their magnitudes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that would be Maybe. good. In your presentation, I was thinking from an international perspective of how important it is to do this research in the US given the uniqueness of parental neglect. You know, it's always an outlier. You have a country with so much resources and at the same time no childcare, no parental leave, no nothing. Mm -hmm. So it's always interesting. But I was wondering, and this is my question, if if maybe you have thought about comparative research with yes. other countries yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. that have yes. more cultures like the Sweden or countries, for example, in Colombia, 18 months uh in the pand into the pandemic, so June 2021, barely a third of the schools were open again. So we, you were talking about months, and I was like, oh, we I know, I know, years. Nationally, it's about this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, there, there is an effort to do a cross-country comparison of school closures' impacts on society that Dean Lillard at Ohio State is leading, and there was a conference last semester that we went to. And I think that Cody Wing might be like editing this special issue of a journal that's that's doing this. But we ha we saw lots of papers presented because this this uh, consortium was trying to standardize the way that school closures are being coded because this um, telephone data actually is available internationally. So um, that was a way of saying, let's have a standard way of defining school closures. Let's look across the countries similar outcomes let's have these papers kind of be presented in venues that they can discuss magnitudes that's one of the things that was the most striking out of that conference was the extent to which here i was saying oh schools closed it was a terrible time period we had so much and then learning about the length even at the time of this conference there were places that were saying oh we just reopened schools mm -hmm. well um yes so yeah, yeah so Really interesting stuff. It's really heroic to try to tease all these factors out. And uh, I want to make it even more difficult. Right? <laughs> I knew you were coming to me. Right. So the disease itself creates stress, mm -hmm. knowing it's out there. And then conflicting information mm -hmm. that is amplified in the media and on social media increases that stress level, especially when you're getting disinformation, which disinformation in epidemics is as old as epidemics themselves, mm -hmm. it turns mm -hmm. out. It's an inordinate time in the history of public health lately. <laughs> and so, you know, I don't know uh, what to do with all that, but I do have a recommendation um, on what might allow you eventually to make some recommendations. And that would be if you could isolate demographically similar towns or cities that took different approaches to school closure, and then try to tease out the differential effects between, between those. I mean, the, yeah, yeah, I... That would at least, you know, if there are any, you know, if there's any way of getting that kind of information that would allow for that kind of natural experiment. Yeah. Yes, I think there'd be high value in, in drawing out these examples, just like I'm thinking 
Callan, Texas versus, right? The, the, it's the right. story of the yeah. tale of two cities yeah. tells a lot and the tale of two school districts would tell. Yeah, Travel? see a lot of variation on that, yeah. Oh, okay, so I was thinking in the following question, I, I'm not sure if you if you can answer it with the with the available data, but it's, so the demand for antidepressants and the demand of alcohol is two things at the same time, no? It's uh, the way you measure that um, these people have uh, changed their behavior because they have been exposed to something, but at the same time, it's something that they, use, they do to mitigate the effect of the shock. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I, I, I'm more stressed because my kids are home and I, I don't have school. And then I, there are two possible options. I can allow my levels of stress to go to the roof or I can take antidepressants or whatever, uh, alcohol, no? So from the point of view of the kids, the interesting question is, what is better, no? <laughs> to have fully stressed parents or parents that deal with antidepressants and alcohol. And I'm not sure if it's yeah. possible, yeah? But maybe you need another exogenous variation on availability of alcohol and antidepressants, which I don't know if it's possible. By the way, alcohol, yes, if you consider that states, they have different laws and regulations with respect to alcohol cells, no? That could maybe- oh, I see, right. Maybe help. But then connect that with children's outcomes. Okay, so telehealth availability, mm -hmm. that if there's something you could say yes. like this area had better tell. Yes, we need some measure. Okay. <laughs> because then I can tell you things about policy. It's like in a situation like this, your paper says, hey, it looks like there is no permanent long run effect that these guys become an addict to these yeah, things. Yeah. On average, on average. detectable. But still, we have the question about kids. We are assuming that if they are doing it more in the short run, it's better for them. But what about for the kids? So if we find a negative effect on the kids, then maybe even if there is no long run for the adults, you want to be more strict with alcohol and antidepressants during a crisis. Yeah. Otherwise, you say, well, we are giving these guys a break during a crisis because no effect or limited effects on kids or even worse, the contrafactual and no long run effect. The, the, yes, yes <laughs> to all that, right? Because what we, what we, because I'm sure, you know, when we think about how are we about the power analyses here, right? In order to detect an effect, it's got to be a pretty sizable effect. Yes. And yet what we are willing as society to overlook is even if there are very few cases where terrible things happened in families that will not get picked up by these kind of analysis, these are really important. So is it that we try and think of what are the what are the data that would allow us to find that? For example, who are the who are using individuals who are not being captured by these kind of databases? Both Medicaid, uninsured, if mm -hmm. even if Medicaid eligible and not using Medicaid, right? Is the total totality of care and the ways in which not antidepressant that would be the indicator. It's something else we can't get at. We don't have measures of real parental stress. Um, but maybe in child, child victimization data and other things, I know that Lindsay Bullinger, who was a PhD student here, faculty now at Georgia Tech, like she has papers on child treatment during pandemic showing. <laughs> One super quick follow-up. If different providers were tougher or easier to get prescriptions, you have an exogenous, well, yeah. there, there might be that yeah. different providers are for or pe different people, but if you can match at the same type of people that they provide them, that it's very tough on, yeah, on um, the presence, but otherwise it is easier. Yeah. Assignment yeah. to judges, kind yes. of. Yeah, we can look at higher and prescribing rates and say, did you happen to be with a family practitioner who generally might have been suggesting that on the call. No. Yeah, and then you, but you need to connect with, with the kids outcome, which is another crazy big data thing already in, a, in an awesome project though. No? Yeah, but this is, I want to put a plug for data resources we're getting on campus, the Federal Statistical yeah. Research Data um, Center, which is opening up and is going to open up in January in, 
in Morrison Hall, very close by. What it is going to allow us to do is get access to geographically, you know, all these public use data sets that we can get from the Census Bureau, like the American Community Survey. You can't get any of these geographic identifiers to do the research, but we will have access to a facility to use federal data that links all kinds of things. So talking about links, there is already versions that links parents' employment records to the um, definitely like lots of things that are linked that I encourage people to think about doing the long run impacts of COVID um, disruptions on with data. Uh, I have a question about social interaction between we it's it's in three month increments right here. The resolution temporal resolution is we have actually monthly okay but um we kind of thought about it as like chunks of this was the you know the spring of post march closure and then the fall yeah you know, just curious like you're talking about school closures that are relatively random they typically would have to do with a higher rate of affection in a given county or in a given school mm -hmm. and so i was thinking like because of, we know that there is a um, mental health impact on people who have been infected even post infection mm -hmm. uh, COVID 19. Could there be an interaction between kids who are out from school because there's a large amount of infection mm -hmm. in their county mm -hmm. that are having mental health issues because? Because they're, you know, have brain fog from COVID, or mm -hmm. because they have, Good you know, question. the mental health aspect of long. Yeah, effect. we have county level infection rates at this time by week, I believe. Sorry, Dario, if you are still there, I think what we did was um, control for it. A lot of these things you're suggesting we could do interactions for, but I think that in as very well. I remember we did have COVID infection rates. But that's also not thinking we should framing think of it that way. That's a good comment. <laughs> um, I really, really like your research design. I mean, two questions. Uh, were you able to calculate uh, age effect? We looked at it uh, in terms of um, whether the impacts are from middle school, elementary, or other. But other than that, I don't think we. Parent age. Parent. Oh, parents' age. We did not stratify by parents' age. Good. Maybe older parents more resilient. Is that the kind of thinking? Yeah. yeah. We 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 should. We did not. Oh no. Yeah. Okay. So that, um, the other question is, you know, just about the unit of analysis. I was thinking about the income, employment situation, Q, interaction with other variables. But I was wondering, you know, does your data allow you to look at the, the, the block level? No, no, we do not. No, we have actually. So we have, uh, for Indiana, we have exact addresses of people for healthcare. We have looked at for when we looked at children's health outcomes, we did look at exact, um, we were able to look, for example, at whether there was a grandparent in the house. That data set for Indiana just wasn't large enough to have statistical power to detect things uh, for this question. We are out of time, uh, which is a good sign, right? I had a moment, I think all of the directors did, where we went to, yeah, you got to read, so, <laughs> where we had um, a moment of whether or not this would work. It's a little bit long, but it, I, I'll ask you afterwards if you've changed your mind and you now feel like you've run the marathon. But, uh, thank you. That that was engaging. Thank you very much, Coastal. You're working for me. So thank you that. for a uh, generous. Stay around. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, except that it was actually a question as well.